welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being patient this evening. We had uh, some slight technical difficulties. Uh, but again, welcome to Gulf Coast State College and welcome to our last citizen science seminar of the semester. I'm Carrie Fioramonte. I'm associate professor of biology here at Gulf Coast State College. And this evening we have a guest and this is actually our second visit from Dr. Jessica Graham. Dr. Graham is the executive director of the St. Andrews and St. Joe Bay's Estuaries Program, and she's actually been working in conservation science, specifically aquatic conservation science, since about 2008. So we are really lucky to have her here. That ages me. <laughs> in, uh, uh, we're so lucky to have her here in Bay County working with us, uh, partnering with all of us to uh, maintain the health of both St. Andrew and St. Joe Bays. Um, so without further ado, she's going to be giving us uh, kind of an update uh, where their program is, uh, the current activities and future endeavors. So thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you so much for being here and for your patience. Um, I promise I was here early and the presentation was loaded. We were ready to go. <laughs> um, that's super loud. It's okay. <laughs> So as Carrie mentioned, um, I did speak a little bit when I first started. So I was still drinking water through the fire hose. Um, I feel like I've got my legs underneath me a little bit better, but we're still super busy. And so I really appreciate the opportunity to update you all on things that we've been doing. And hopefully you can kind of see a place for yourself in our program as well. So one of the first things that people ask me when I tell them that I work for the estuary program is they say the what program? And so I like to start there. Um, an estuary and a bay are very similar, but what a lot of people don't realize is that St. Andrew Bay is actually an estuary. And the defining characteristic there is the fact that it's fed by a freshwater river. So for us, that's Econfina. Uh, and then we have a bay, which is a partially enclosed body of water, but it doesn't have that freshwater source. And so we cover both St. Andrew Bay and St. Joseph Bay, but we also cover the entire landscape of the watershed. So it's not just what's in the water that we're concerned with. It's also um, everything that's in the watershed that's draining into these different systems. And what we're trying to do is really meet this big vision of having healthy, resilient bays and estuarine habitats, working together with vibrant, resilient, and sustainable communities. And so it's a really big balancing act between what our habitats need and what our communities need. <clears throat> and we know in our area, as you can probably tell if you drive on Panama City Beach roads right now, is that we have a really strong economic tie to our resources. And so we have a preliminary economic analysis that was created by Dr. Julie Harrington out of FSU Tallahassee. And what she has done is she draws this half mile buffer across our estuary and looks at the different businesses that are in that area. And what she has found is that in this half mile, just a half mile buffer, it's a very small little portion in 2020, businesses that were in that half mile buffer contributed over $4.4 billion in indirect sales and supported over 51,000 workers. So you can imagine how important our Bay system and a healthy Bay system is to our economy, as well as to the rest of the way that we love to live. I always talk about it as it's our lifeblood. But as you can imagine, when you have all of that, 51,000 workers, all of those businesses, it's a really big balancing act. And there's a lot of different levels to that balancing act of being able to identify what our habitats need and what our communities need and how we can find that um, middle ground between the two. And so this program is not, our program is new, but the concept of these SGA programs is not new. There's over 28 different SGA programs that are nationally designated across the country. And that's what we're modeled after. We're not nationally designated, but we're modeled after them because it's working. They're making huge changes in their watershed. Tampa Bay is one of those. Um, Charlotte Harbor, Indian River Lagoon, which is working to address the things that are going on in the Indian River Lagoon. So we've modeled after that, but one of the first things that um, happened when the funding came from the oil spill for this program 
was a stakeholder assessment. And so some of you may have been interviewed during that assessment, but it was looking at what works, what doesn't work, what needs to be in place in order to make this program successful. So with that and the guide from the National Estuary Program, we set up a governance structure like this. This was set up prior to me, but we have three different levels, basically. Our policy board at the highest level are locally elected officials, and that is because of what the stakeholder assessment showed is that the local officials need to be at the table. They need to be able to hear things coming from the other committees. The policy board is informed by um, non-voting members that are your regulatory agencies, things like FWC, EPA, Army Corps, those folks that are on the non-voting seat. And then we also have this management council level. Those are the folks that are 15 seats as of now that represent the different perspectives across the community. And so that's going to be Port of Panama City is there. We have academia, someone from Gulf Coast is there. Um, citizens that have been playing a huge role in conservation for a long time are on that board. And so they're really looking at, let's make sure the things coming out of our committees are representing all of these perspectives. And they're not just science, they're not just community, but they're everything. And then we have our advisory committees at the bottom. That is anyone and everyone that wants to be involved can get involved at the advisory committee. They're really the ones that are creating things that go up to the policy board, first the management council, then the policy board. And all of that gets filtered by estuary program staff. So those three committees are your STEM committee, which is your science, technology, engineering, and modeling. So they're your technical folks. Then you have development and finance. Uh, right now we have a lot of grant writers for the municipalities on there. Um, welcome more perspectives to that uh, committee always, but they're the ones that are really trying to figure out how are we going to implement these projects that are being identified, and then how are we going to keep the program sustainably funded. And then the community action committee that's really figuring out, all right, what's gonna resonate with the community, what do the communities need, and how to get meet those science needs through the community side. So this is our team. We're just three people. Um, we have Brittany Pace, who's up in the back. <laughs> um, Ryan Rossi, who is our scientist, and then myself. So, you know, small but mighty. Um, but we are working with all of our stakeholders to be able to meet that vision. But what I really like to talk about is that it's not us doing these things. It's that governance structure and all of these people that are represented that have staff that are working to do these projects, figure these projects out, and, and really always looking at different decisions that can be made because we can fix things all day long, but it's all about the decisions that are being made and how can we look at those different decisions. And so this is really where our mission comes into play, which is to collaborate with all these different diverse stakeholders to improve our understanding of what the bay and estuary and the watershed needs, and then to develop and implement these projects and different decisions to protect and restore our bays. So that's what we're trying to do. And all of that is going to be put into a plan. I know what you're thinking, another plan is going to sit on the shelf. I thought the same thing. <laughs> but what we're looking to do is a comprehensive conservation and management plan. So this is, again, very similar. It's modeled after the National Estuary Program. What's different about these plans is what's contained within, and it's very action-oriented. So I've been in science for a while, and it's really easy to make science products, to have this ideal, this is what people need to do, but it falls apart because it doesn't really bring in that community side and there's no action, there's a lot of words. So at the end of the day, we're gonna end up something similar to this of you know a coffee table, fancy document, but what it really is, is all about what's inside in these action plans. So these action plans are trying to identify through a process, what are we gonna do? Why do we need to do it? How are we gonna do it? Who's gonna work with us? Where's the money gonna come from? And what's our return on investment? 
So that's, that's where it gets harder. <laughs> um, but we're really, really uh, working hard on getting these things figured out. And so this is the process that we've taken. So identifying first, what are our watershed concerns? What are the big issues? And everything that we do should be addressing these watershed concerns. We synthesize things, existing documents that have existed for a while, recent documents. Um, we held a lot of different workshops. And based on feedback that we got and from those in, the information in those documents, we came up with different watershed concerns. Then through our committees, we asked, you know, what are our desired outcomes? What do we want out of all of this? How are we going to get there? Which is our goals? And then those actions, what are we going to do? And then the action plans that I just showed are really that brown box, which is the activities, the outputs, the outcomes, all those fun metrics. And that's where we're at right now. So we have gone this far. So when I spoke not even a year ago, maybe, we were, we were way over on this side. So now we're finally, it's exciting for me <laughs> because we have done a lot of work and it's really coming together. And so uh, we have these activities, outputs, metrics, leads, figuring these things out. So it's been, it's, it's been a lot, but we are now where we're trying to identify those with the committees. So our watershed concern, concerns, like I said, we synthesized a lot of information and came up with these different, these eight different concerns, and that might be kind of small, but we have community engagement, recreational opportunities, stormwater, really looking at flooding, wastewater, habitat loss, sediment, nutrients and pathogens, and then making sure we're thinking about things with changing environmental conditions. So things are always gonna change in the future. And that is really what formulated these four focus areas. And so we have water and sediment quality and quantity, natural resources and species conservation, resiliency, and then stewardship. And Brittany is working with the Community Action Committee on the stewardship, and Ryan is working with the STEM Committee, particularly on the top three, the water and sediment quality and quantity, natural resources, and resiliency. So those are kind of how the focus areas are divided amongst the committees. And that's where everything is de being developed within those focus areas. So the way that we have to be able to do this is through information. So it's always about synthesizing information. And one of the most amazing things that we have the luxury of having is St. Andrew Baywatch. So St. Andrew Baywatch has been monitoring water quality for over, around 30 years. And there are so many programs that don't have an idea of what their water quality is and don't have any data when they start out. And we have that, <laughs> thanks to St. Andrew Baywatch and the volunteers for them. Um, and so um, Ryan worked with Baywatch to synthesize this information. And you have trends in what is meeting your numeric nutrient criteria. And so the details are interesting to me, but maybe not to everyone. But you can read this by East Bay, North Bay, St. Andrew Bay proper, which is this area here, Grand Lagoon, West Bay, and then St. Joe Bay, which I didn't show because we're in Bay County right now. Um, and so it just tells you red, it violated one, um, yellow, or red, it violated two or more, yellow, it violated one, green, it didn't violate any. So it's all about how much nutrients are in the water on whether or not you violated. So as you can see, there's a lot of areas of opportunity. <laughs> um, the map here um, also shows another thing that Baywatch has been able to do is sample the water for fecal coliform. And so understanding the where the fecal coliform is coming from can help figure out what actions need to be taken in order to reduce those bacteria. And so the way that this is, is that it's color coded with the number of stations or the number of samples within the water body that have violated the um, criteria of 800 is your measurement. And so again, areas of opportunity, <laughs> things to just be aware of. And, and I know a lot of municipalities are trying very hard to work on these things. And these things are not easy problems to fix. They take a lot of money and a lot of time, but, um, and I will say that a lot of them are working very hard on trying to get a lot of funds into the door to be able to address some of these things, but um, 
this is, you know, again, lots of areas of opportunity, but understanding this and the locations of these things help to inform our program of where do we need to do things and where do we, and how and what needs to do what, what we need to do. It also tells us that we don't always know the source. And so the numeric nutrient criteria, those nutrients can come from a lot of different things. The same thing with the fecal bacteria. And so one of the things that um, we have proposed to the Bay County Commissioners is to look at where the sources are from. And so you can do that using different things like stable isotopes and DNA sequencing, which is really exciting. <laughs> so you can take a water sample and actually know where that comes from, whether it was from a dog, um, a cat, a human, all of those fun things. Um, but that, this information informs that. And then it informs what we're going to do in the future. And so this is where we're at with all of these different focus areas and actions. And so this is a lot of information. You don't need to read it. But it basically has what our goal is, what our desired outcomes are, and then those actions. So those numbered items that are in bold are the actions. Those are going to be fed into an action plan. And so if we take this example from Natural Resources and we have an action of develop an outreach and education strategies to increase conservation of seagrass and restoration, we get this action plan. And so here's that same develop outreach strategies. And this is where we get the information of what are we going to do? Why do we need to do it? How? Who? where's the money coming from, and the return on investment. And that's the status that we're at right now. These are draft, fresh off the presses. <laughs> and so now we're filling these in, trying to figure out exactly who our partners are going to be, who's going to lead it. And this one in particular is very exciting for all of our committees because Seagrass, we know how important it is, but that's really where this campaign has been launched, which is to raise awareness to how important seagrass is to our community, to our economy, to the fish, to everything. And so one thing that Brittany's been working really hard at is to understand um, what information is given to tourists when they rent a boat. And so what we're trying to do is really target those direct impacts to seagrass of prop scars. And so she's gone around and talked to different folks. What do you, what do you give to them? And where, is there opportunity for partnering? And so this is a map of where the seagrass is. And so we can really very easily just overlay it on a static map. But what we really want to do is create an app that's similar to Google Maps, but on the water. And so that it can tell you, hey, this area is off limits because it's Tyndall or it's the Navy base. The Navy base has a mission going on. Um, there's shallow water here. Make sure you trim up, go slow, those types of information. It may work for 40% you know, of the people. And then the static maps may work for 5% of the people. And then there's another way to work for another percentage. So we got to hit them in a lot of different places. One of the things that we are also excited about that's going to be launching soon is that we'll be building Seagrass Nursery. So St. Joe Foundation provided us some money to set up a pilot. It's a very small seagrass um, nursery. Then we'll be going out and scouting to see if we have some flowering seagrass beds. We'll be growing seedlings in this nursery, and then, fingers crossed, if they survive, we'll be working with our partners to figure out where to plant them. And so one of the restoration techniques with uh, seagrass restoration is to take from a donor bed and move that to a restoration site. This will allow us to not have to take from those donor beds and actually grow new seagrass. Um, this is difficult in North Florida, and so that's one reason why we don't have a nursery like this up here, because of the it, we get cold. This is really successful in Tampa, and there's other facilities around the state that do seagrass nurseries, but this is basically a pilot project to say, hey, can we do it? Does it work? And can we expand it if it does? Another project that'll be launching is um, more research based project, and this is um, looking at the effectiveness of living shorelines. And so living shorelines is one way. This is a project that St. Andrew Baywatch did 
You put different um, oyster reef or class one riprap with oyster shell in it in these kind of crescent shapes. And what it allows you to do is to accrete sediment behind and then have marsh grasses grow behind that. They're very effective, um, but there's a lot of questions about their effectiveness and when that effectiveness will occur. And so this project will look at the effectiveness of previously installed reef structures across the entire panhandle. And so we're working with other estuary programs across the panhandle to see what's our effectiveness and then to translate that into economic benefits. And so how many more fish do we get from these? How many more um, oysters do we get from these projects? And then turning that into dollars. And this is really where there's a lot of residents that are okay putting these reefs in front of their houses, but when you get into commercial or um, city-owned parks, there's a lot more hesitancy because of the scale that you're scaling up to. And so we're hoping that this information will help to provide a little more comfort to these different folks, both commercial and um, on the city and county folks. So, where can you fit in? <laughs> um, so we have a couple opportunities. We're very new and we don't have a lot of volunteer opportunities. We usually just have folks, you know, work with our partners um, because we don't want to create a volunteer program that's redundant to another and we're still learning about everything that's going on. And so we will have a future call for seagrass kind of scouts, um, folks that if we find a flowering bed, we'll ask to walk along shore and collect those different seedlings so that we can um, grow them in the nursery. And so we're still organizing all that fun stuff and we have to scout out where the flowering beds are. We may need some nursery, seagrass nursery volunteers that know something about how to grow things, which I am not a green thumb. Um, so anybody who is, I'd love to have you. Uh, FWC has a seagrass restoration site. Do you all remember the El Dorado? Um, the El Dorado is a big old boat that was off the shoreline of um, FSU after Hurricane Michael. They're finally able to restore that um, seagrass site where it grounded. And so that's going to be happening May 10th and 11th with a backup site on the 12th. FWC is looking for volunteers that are willing to get wet and plant some seagrass. Um, there's a link here. If you're interested, you can see me after or talk to Brittany and we can get um, that link out to you. And then St. Andrew Baywatch is always looking for water quality monitors, um, especially folks that can drive a boat. Um, and so you can contact um, Johnny or anyone else in here. Yeah. <laughs> or you can contact us and we can get you in touch. Another area is to get involved in our committees. And so right now that is a lot of our work is on the committee level, making these decisions, creating these action plans. Um, and so if you are interested in kind of being where decisions are being made, our meetings are all open to the public. We are a sunshine program, nothing is hidden. Our previous meetings are online where you can access all of our meeting notes, our presentations, everything. Um, and so we encourage, we would love to see you at any of our committees, but all of our committees, um, anywhere that you'd like to plug in. And if you are interested, but you're a little hesitant because we've gone so far and have so much information, we would love to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and give you kind of a rundown of what's happened and then what's gonna happen. And I think you can visit our website. Uh, we do have social media, Facebook, Instagram. And you can sign up for a newsletter there, you can sign up for a committee there as well, or just contact us directly. And that's all I have. Happy to take any questions. Um, regarding the seagrass restoration, do you guys have an idea where you might go with those, like certain larger locations or maybe the prop scar areas? With the, the lassia from the nursery. Mm -hmm. So our permit currently does not include actually planting, planting them. So we would have to give them to another entity. Okay. So DEP is working on trying to get a permit to be able to plant in those prop scars, especially in the aquatic preserve. Um, Tyndall also has some seagrass restoration work that's going to be starting. It's not generally thalassia, but um, there may be opportunity to start intermixing 
And so it, it's all about the, the permit. We were trying to do it for El Dorado, but it came too quickly, and the permit was only for shoal grass. So there's all those fun things. <laughs> you didn't mention the old pass. Uh, have you been involved with that at all, and what are your thoughts? I have not been involved. I am just aware of what's going on since they have the engineering company that's really leading everything. Um, so I just try to be informed of what's going on. I know it just went forward to environmental impact assessment, and so I believe that engineer may have subcontracted out to get the environmental data consolidated um, to be able to move forward with the environmental impact assessment. The estuary program is not advocacy. We don't take a stance on any project. <laughs> we can only inform through science. Um, and I don't believe Baywatch, or not the data that uh, we saw from Baywatch, has sites there um, to be able to speak to the water quality. There is seagrass there. Um, and the site that they recently chose is actually on Tyndall Air Force Base. So they kind of moved it from where it used to be um, closer into Tyndall. Thank you. Other questions? <laughs> How will I get there? I just have a question about the best way to approach government when your hands are bound. So what's happening at our lake, we're a freshwater lake that is under the uh, Bay Watch and uh, Lake Watch program, mm -hmm. low water lake out mm -hmm. on the beach. And we have, I know, a very high fecal count in our lake. We also have a oyster uh, bar called Dusty's Oyster Bar that's right on the lake. <clears throat> and they throw their oyster shells out without washing them. They have attracted about 300 Muscovy ducks. When I call the city, the city says we're not allowed to relocate them. We could euthanize them if we'd like to ourselves. We can call a trapper. But the FWC and the city of Panama City Beach will do nothing about it. And so we're having a hard time because I'm, I'm trying to encourage them that it should be their city code that those oyster shells are washed off before they're laid down for the parking so it may not attract the Muscovy ducks at that point. Right. And so I'm just wondering, what is the best practice to reach out to local governments when your hands are so bound by other agencies? Um, hmm. That's it's a tricky one. one. Yeah. <laughs> you can get back to me if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Turn the video cameras off. <laughs> um, so what we have been told a lot with those kind of more difficult things is to find ordinances that have been implemented elsewhere and been successful. And so if there's a way, there's a, a group called A Thousand Friends of Florida, and you can reach out to them or even like the TNC folks that may have ideas of different ordinances that have addressed like oyster shell disposal um, that then the cities would be able to have more lakes to stand on. And so that's where like the county and city folks have said, you know, we talk about living shorelines. It's easier to get a permit to put in a seawall than a living shoreline. Um, so how can we make that easier? And they always say, you know, if you can find something that exists elsewhere that has passed legal, has passed, you know, people going against it, then that's a lot easier for us to start to explore to implement. So that would be my first suggestion is to figure out, have you approached the oyster bar themselves and talked to them at all? Okay, that's another idea would be to just approach them and see if there's a way where, you know, if, if there's bins that can be purchased and they put it in there and then we can haul it out or someone else can haul it out because I do believe Franklin's Promise and St. Andrew Baywatch has been interested in doing an oyster shell um, recycling program and so they might be the perfect first signer up <laughs> um, where you know they don't have to do anything except put it in the bins and then you know someone else can come collect that they keep their bins and then that solves the problem at least into the future it's not going to solve the current problem you have of course but um, hopefully when there is no food there's no birds <laughs> but yeah 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 so those would be my two suggestions um, and 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and we can connect you with Franklin's Promise if that's of interest for that oyster bar. Great. Thank you for the question. We have another question. My understanding is the Muscogee ducks are are a um, foreign. They're uh, not invasive, part yeah. of the wildlife. Mm. Is there any way that you can get the wildlife permission or somebody to remove the ducks? Um, out to the meat market. <laughs> uh, similar uh, issue with like Cuban tree frog invasive yeah. control. Yeah. Well, you could grind them up and make chicken food out of them, you know? Yeah. It'd be good. It, it does. It gets really tricky when you start talking about invasive species and things like this because it's like, uh, it, it sometimes makes you feel like you're running around in circles. Absolutely. Other questions? Who here has uh, added to that wonderful data chart that Jessica had up there for water quality for Baywatch? Is, is there anybody in the room that's been adding to that? that I was gonna say, I know a couple of y'all have been probably out every month on boats taking those water, uh, those water samples. I know my boyfriend and his mother uh, Aaron and Diane Bateman, they are, were very frequent volunteers also for that organization. That um, data Henry is... Watson, just a variety of yeah. people that have really helped add to that data. And I hope all of those folks, if y'all are listening and watching, we thank yeah. you so much because it <laughs> yeah. really gave you that baseline data that you Absolutely. really need. Yep. Um, and it just really gave you that big head start. Well, and it's going to help us measure impact yeah. you know and so continuing it will really allow us to be like hey if you know this project happens we can see a return on investment in the water quality it's a slow response because again water quality is a symptom <laughs> of an issue and so it is a slow response but continuing that will help us actually see what's our return on investment so that's right that's right and I have a, a question that kind of popped into my head uh, when you were talking about water quality um, <clears throat> and talking about the government, uh, the municipalities, our elected officials, policy programs, uh, also going after funds uh, to, I don't know, help people get off of septic tanks, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. I would think that that would um, add a variety of different pollutants, nutrients, and, as well as perhaps coliforms. It can. It what can. about pet waste? It can, yep. So pet waste can be an issue um, generally through the stormwater drains. Right. Um, septic tanks can be issues. Um, and I know that City of Panama City has funds to run septic or sewer into Kings Point. And then I believe there's a one in North Bay. Deer Point Lake is maybe the county. Um, Panama City Beach is doing, oh uh, gosh, Laguna Beach perhaps. I believe so. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then they're still working on Elizabeth Ave and those others. So there's a lot of work trying to get there. Um, and then they are starting to also bring in funds to encourage hookup um, by alleviating some of the residents. Um, out of the pocket cost to hook up, which is Absolutely. oftentimes a barrier. I see pipes, like I think my parents have, sorry, mom and dad, have a pipe sticking out of their yard because they don't want to pay the right. thousands of dollars to hook up. Yeah. So yes, yeah, some incentives. And they are talking about different ordinances as well. So I know the, the county, I believe, made it where if you have sewer within 100 feet of your house, you have to hook up. Oh. Um, and DEP is also making it where if it's available, they will not repermit. And there's nuances uh, to this, so don't take me at face black and white. It's never black and white. This but is a, um, like a strong encouragement. Yes, to get yes. Well, I think it basically increases the amount of treatment your septic tank has to do if you're not going to hook up, and so that's generally cost prohibitive for most residents. And so it, it's really encouraging that hookup. There's, and that's something that's been identified in our, our actions is understanding what those barriers are right. because it's not always money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not always availability. And mm -hmm. so being able to provide that information to the local government so that maybe they can look at a different strategy is, is one of the things that we've talked a lot about. That's right. Yes, a group of partners, not just scientists, right. but community members, policymakers. Right. 
What other questions do we have? Who else wants to grow seagrass? I do. <laughs> Morons. As someone who just hooked up to the sewer, I don't know how all those people in Long Beach Drive are going to afford it. Yeah. It was the impact fees alone are $6,600. That's your starter fee. Yeah. And then it was another nine for the equipment and hooking the it pump. up. The pump, yep. So, yes. more expensive than I thought. Oh, yes. yes. Especially nowadays. Oh, it's. Wow. Uh huh, interesting. Okay. So, no sharing. Every home must have an individual. Okay. Right. For the impact fee, yeah, it would be based on how many how many drains you have going into the sewer. Yeah. And we have one more question. I did hear today I got talking that they that Bay County is going up fifty percent on your water uh, water charging. So in, mm. in sewer is based on what amount of water you use, so your bill will go up everybody's bill will go up fifty percent. Wow. I'm assuming. There may be a price increase with the water, which that's right. That's another issue. When you hook up to sewer, you now have to pay for it. Yes. I know. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. Yes, Molly. <laughs> and I have to ask because it's like the elephant in the room always in my life. But how does the um, program, uh, the Estuaries program, feel about? outfall projects. I know there is one currently in the um, uh, Naples area. Mm -hmm. It was exactly the same footprint that they were going to do here. It is exactly the same engineers that are going to do it here. It was described as for different purpose mm -hmm. for down there. So I'm wondering, is it a snake oil that they sell to the community for their own uh, results. So, um, as everyone may know, and here many people may know, Low Water Lake will become uh, stormwater uh, outfall mm -hmm. potentially. And so, I'm looking to see how does the community at large feel about that because it's a big tug of war in my heart between community and habitat. And how do we share that uh, with large developers such as St. Joe that do invest in our community? But to what end to some of our waterways? Yes, it's a very complicated balancing act. Um, the way that, you know, so going back to science, ideally stormwater is treated naturally before it is pumped anywhere, right? So that has been kind of the suggestion given is, you know, if that is not possible, you need to explain why that's not possible. And so what's the cost of being able to pump that stormwater somewhere else where it can be treated naturally versus pumping it into the bay or into the Gulf? Um, so it tends, what I see as far as community perspectives tend to be where it affects me, you know, if it affects you, then there's strong feelings, pro or con. Um, so I haven't heard a lot about that project except for the people around that area um, and the beach area. Same with, you know, the old pass. There's a lot of people that it will directly impact and they have very strong feelings about it. But again, you know, we just go back to the science side of it. So ideally, we would have stormwater treated in a wetland before it goes anywhere. If that's not possible, we need to figure out the best way to do things. And I don't know enough about the ins and outs about what is in those outfalls to be able to scientifically discuss them. But, um, you know, there's, there's always pros and cons to everything, especially when we can't do our ideal solution, which is to build a big wetland um, <laughs> before it goes out. <clears throat> I know I didn't give you what you want, but. <laughs> yeah, it does seem like a very big question mark. It does. Mm -hmm. I, I love the idea of Conservation Park, um, you know, rather than discharging waste, treated wastewater or fluid into West Bay, they now direct it into wetlands. Mm -hmm. Um, and it seems to be great. Uh, I guess that might be a great question to ask too, is what are we seeing in West Bay? Mm -hmm. Are we seeing improvements? 
Um, I'd love to, um, anyone that wants to present on that, I would <laughs> love to have you for a citizen science because it would be wonderful to know were those efforts, uh, what, what were the, what is the result of those efforts? <clears throat> and then it does, if you ask me, is related to your question, Molly, because it seems to me like we want to keep that water percolating to the aquifer rather than sending it out into the salt water. And that's just my opinion, just so you know that. Right, that goes back to the wetlands. You know, I'm not you affiliated with Jessica yeah. Graham. I, <laughs> I mean, it's the same idea of wetlands. You know, you treat it by nature. Um, so whether it's a wastewater wetland, a stormwater wetland, and I know that there's a lot of desire from municipalities to get a regionalized stormwater wetland so that a lot of the stormwater that's going on in development can get pumped to a regional stormwater wetland before it gets just funneled somewhere else. Um, it's just, it's finding the land, it's finding the money to do it. And so there's a couple different parcels that have been identified by not just one jurisdiction, but multiple jurisdictions. So there, the, I would say that they understand and, and that's what I hear anyway, and I'm not like a proponent or whatever, but I hear, you know, there, there's a desire to do it differently. Um, I think our community being an old community, we are still fixing things that happened from Michael four years later. And a lot of those issues were because our stuff was outdated to begin with and now it's damaged. And so there's a lot of work that they're working on trying to do to be able to fix those issues and then address the newer development issues. Perhaps it may be a mixture of both, maybe treating and pumping to some wetlands, mm -hmm. and then there may still be a need to discharge some into a water body. Right. Because it's, it's often, I would think it'd be also beneficial to slow down that water. Slow down and filter. And reduce, that's yep. right. <laughs> <laughs> yep, slow down and filter. Other questions this evening? How do you slow down? Well, I was thinking more like the slow, the slowing down of just moving the water out instead of moving it into ditches and sending it out into the bay, put it into wetlands. We need to do more of that in Panama City. You can Our do, wetlands are drying out. You can do a lot of bioswales as well. So even just the way you treat the road prism of how the water comes off of a roadway, the more space that you can have, the slower the, it's going to go as well. And it needs to be vegetated. Um, and so there's a lot of different, more urbanized approaches to doing things. And that's kind of where we're at is, you know, we're building, we have some parcels, but as those are built, we're urbanized around it. And so being innovative is really important. And that's one thing that we try to bring. We have a stormwater working group. That's part of our, we have the municipalities that sit on that. And um, <clears throat> we're trying to, identify innovative technologies that they might not know about because they're trying to fix the stormwater issues. <laughs> um, so one of the things that was identified was the flooding that can occur because of high tides or even storm surge. And so we're going to get some sensors created from University of Florida to put into these structures that will actually tell them during a high tide event how much water or how much space they have left in that structure. Um, so things like that of, you know, they didn't know about it. We were able to bring that information to them and they're super excited about being able to, to implement those. We're going to try it as a pilot first um, and see if it works the way it's supposed to. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Um, but then, you know, Lynn Haven has used some different innovative techniques recently with some different types of concrete. And so um, there was another talk about using rupia at Alt Falls to filter and they saw significant nutrient decreases. Um, you know, there's a longer term question of how long does that last for that since it's innovative, no one knows. <laughs> um, but there's there's a lot of work that's going on to try to do these things in more urbanized areas. And so that's one area that we're trying to help inform as best as we can not be a proponent for these, just inform. <laughs> but that's the wonderful thing about the program. It's modeled after successful programs. It's bringing together many people. It's a diverse group of people, right? right? And when you have more people, more brains, more experiences, and that is diversity, that's real diversity, um, then you get more accomplished. Yes. 
That's right. So come Other join questions? us. <laughs> I don't think you should get the mic back. <laughs> <laughs> um, so my question is on that note, on, on um, water filtering through, uh, what is the consideration for the, um, the nutrients in that water backing that water up? So for instance, our lake has hydrilla in it. Hmm. The last time I did a, a last this past month when I did my water samples, they couldn't even filter the water. There's some huge algal bloom that's I saw going that, on. I got pictures of that. Yeah, <laughs> and so, so if, if, if the water can't go through a filter, then what happens to people's homes? I think that potentially it can create flooding instead of relieving flooding in some instances um, where the sediment or the particulates are so fine that they get caught up in some of those filters. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's definitely, it's, it's nutrients, it's sediment, it's all of it working, working together in a good and a bad way, right? Um, so yeah, I think I did see those pictures of that huge bloom. I thought Christina, I think, said it was diatom bloom and we were trying to get some samples, but she took one for us and then she's like, no, I, it's diatoms. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it was thick for sure. Um, but it's, when you have a system that's not able to act like the natural system it was, you're going to have impacts to it. And so it's trying to figure out what you can do as far as, you know, lawn care, buffering, anything like that, that can help alleviate some of those sources. And then I think they've gotten some money to clean up. And so hopefully that can help to reset where the lake, not reset, but set back um, some of those issues, especially on the sediment side of things. Yeah, it's all about natural functioning. We need, and that's a lot of the language that you'll see in the stuff is all about functioning ecosystems. Because <laughs> we can't really set it back to what it was in a lot of cases. You know, we don't really truly know what it was. And then what's your benchmark for what that, that should be? And so it's, it's to, to me, it's all about looking at what do we have now and what do we need to make it functioning and how can we figure that out? Who wants to grow seagrass? Me. <laughs> Did you guys get a greenhouse? We have. We will be setting it up. I think we just got approval on the site at cool. FSU. Fantastic. Um, yeah. Wonderful, so. wonderful. I've done some aquatic plant research. Okay, about, great. Yeah. Come on over. Because <laughs> I have not. You will. Yeah. Like, that's okay. Now, that, that would be wonderful. Um, I'm so excited to hear that you can actually grow it. Yes. Not just pull plugs yes. and plant plugs. That's wonderful. Yes. Or at least we're, it's a pilot, another pilot, right? Ours is, but there are nurseries that are successful doing it. And so for us, it's more location pilot. Um, so it'll be interesting to see if we can keep them alive mm -hmm. through the winter. <laughs> right, right. Well, that would be wonderful. Huh? Yeah. Deeper water. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So you're going to volunteer area. for us as well. <laughs> we have volunteers. Yeah. Wonderful. We'll be successful with all of the brains. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a wonderful idea. Um, other questions? I'm using the proximity trick. <laughs> I'm really excited. Um, I have not been able to really visit with your committees and hear what's going on, so I'm really excited to hear mm -hmm. it because we are starting to fire up uh, our own student uh, groups here, research act activities and things like Fantastic. that. I'm really finally, after the hurricane recovery, yeah. about to be able to uh, you know, really accomplish some things, so definitely count us in. Definitely, and the, on our website, the calendar of all of our meetings is up, so you can see when we're meeting, you can join virtually, you can come in person, and so it's as accessible as we can make it.
and we have some swag that Brittany brought. So please grab some koozies, some reusable straws. That's what those metal things are. Um, and some pens and some other information as well. That's right. There's some events that um, yes. are going on uh, that looks like are very much affiliated with you. Yes. So we do have a photography contest going on. So if you have some pictures, please submit them. Um, is this up there as well? Yep. So you can grab one of these. Uh, we want as many pictures as we can possibly get. The winner will get a $100 gift certificate for Half Hitch. If you like to go swimming and collect sea urchins, there is a sea urchin roundup in St. Joe Bay. You do need a boat. Um, there may be ability to ride on another boat, but that's um, probably going to come down to the last minute that we know that information. Uh, but you can collect as many sea urchins as your fingers can handle. They do provide gloves and bags, bring your own snorkel gear. Um, it's super fun. I think I collected about a thousand on my own one time in one portion of one seagrass bed. And so there's um, an overpopulation in a certain portion of St. Joe Bay that is really affecting the seagrass. And so they will munch them all the way down to the rhizome. And so they're having a big impact on the seagrass coverage. So they move them to deeper water. They don't eat them. <laughs> and then we will be at the Sap House um, for Earth Day with this Make a Waves program. There's a lot of other great folks. You can follow Make a Waves on Facebook. And so they will talk about the different, I can't remember which one I read today, of who will be giving some presentations there. Um, we'll be there with a booth so you can come talk to us a little bit more one on one. And there's going to be a lot of other vendors there also. This is at the Sap House in downtown Panama City. And there are other Earth Day folks going to be out at the um, Mackenzie Park, or no, under the Oaks, under the Oaks Park um, with the market. And so there's lots of Earth Day events. So make sure you uh, get ready for a fun day and go and make your rounds. <laughs> yep, those are the three. And you can find all of this on our Facebook page when you like us and our Instagram page when you like us. All right. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for coming out this evening. Um, again, we're going to take our summer break, basically. We may have something happening at the end of August for Citizen Science. We'll let you know. We definitely have September the 12th. Oh, and I wrote all this down and said it on the radio yesterday, and I can't remember it now. Uh, John Brooker, uh, John Brooker uh, with the Sea Urchin Roundup, I believe, uh, September the 12th, and then October the 10th is going to be the Gulf Terrapin Project with Dan Cantazzoni and Rick O'Connor, I believe, are our facilitators that evening. So y'all enjoy your summer, and if you would like to be part of our Citizen Science Seminar Series, please contact me. We are happy to host you. So thanks a lot.